Good morning, everyone. We have just started our live broadcast. Uh, I think I'll start going through some of the logistics and the admin stuff for the live session today, and that should give us a couple of minutes of buffer so that anybody who's still in the process of logging in can log in. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's live session for all incoming graduate students for winter 2022. Uh, today's session is going to be an opportunity for you to hear the latest updates from GSPA, which is the Graduate Student and Postdoctoral Affairs Office, and GSA, which is the Graduate Student Association, and ask questions about what to expect in your upcoming graduate program. So thanks again for taking the time to be with us. Uh, hopefully this will be valuable information for you. My name is Jigar and I will be the moderator for today's session. This live session is a part of several live sessions that we host as a part of Grad Ready, which is a virtual program for uh, incoming graduate students designed for you to be oriented with graduate studies at the University of Waterloo. So uh, hopefully, you know, this program helps you transition into this new role that you're about to begin and it helps you prepare for your first term uh, as you begin your journey. In addition to live sessions, we also have other resources. Uh, the hub for these resources is the Grad Ready course on Learn, where you will find discussion boards, con content modules, and other things. Uh, please note that the session is being recorded, so we will upload the recorded session as, as well as the presentation slides that are shown in, in the live session today, in case you want to review it at your time at a later date and the recordings will be found in Grad Ready Learn uh, under the Live Sessions Recordings tab. So give it another half a minute or so so that uh, everybody else who's still logging in can join. Uh, continuing on with the, the logistics while everybody's still logging in, uh, if you need to turn on captions, you have the option of doing so. The instructions are on the screen right now, you go to settings, click on captions and select English. Um, Teams live event have a special tab for asking questions. It's the Q&A bubble at the top right corner of the screen, as you can also see in the in this, the screen that I'm sharing right now. Uh, you click on that and you can type the question in in the chat area. If you would like to ask questions anonymously, please make sure you check post as anonymous. Uh, the questions will be sent to the moderator, which is me, to approve and respond to. If there's a lot of questions, I'll try to filter out ones which I think deserve to go to, you know, the wider audience. Uh, questions that need a quick response, such as yes or no or link, uh, I'll try to just type that response in and publish the answer. Uh, but questions that need more elaboration, we'll take them to our panelists and we'll try to answer them then. All the unanswered questions will be collected and we'll try to get the answers to you um, after the live session is over uh, through our discussion boards, which you will find again on the Learn this Grad Ready uh, course modules. So in case there's a lot of questions and we can't get to all of them, don't worry, we'll collect the questions and we'll post them on the discussion boards. If you have questions that you think of after the live session is over, please try and use the discussion boards again to ask the questions and we'll try to get you the answer. Uh, we have discussion boards dedicated to specific live events that happen so that you can just go to that live event and post on that board. And that way we know that you wanted to ask questions regarding this particular live session. Uh, once again, the Grad Ready modules have a live session recordings tab where the recording of this live session will be uploaded. And please note that no inappropriate language will be tolerated. So if you ask questions with, which include inappropriate or racist language, we will dismiss them or take any more strict action. I would also like to take some time to provide a territorial, territorial acknowledgement. Although many of us are working from home right now, much of the work that happens at the University of Waterloo takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus in Waterloo is located on the Haldimand Tract, 
the land that was promised to the six nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. If you'd like to learn more about our active work towards reconciliation, which takes place across the campus through research, learning, teaching and community building, please note that all these efforts are centralized within the Indigenous Initiatives Office. If you'd like to see a link in the chat, uh, I'll post it shortly. And please, uh, we encourage you to take a look and try to learn more about our efforts towards reconciliation. That being said, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's session. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Jigar. I'm a moderator for today's session. I'm a PhD candidate at the Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering Department, and I serve as a discipline specialist for the Grad Ready program within the Student Success Office. Our presenters for today are Jeff, Dr. Jeff Casello, who's the Associate Vice President for the GSPA, the Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs Office. And we have Tyler Hampton, who is the VP of Communications at the Graduate Student Association. And without wasting any more time, I think we can get started with today's presentation. Uh, first up, I'd like to invite Dr. Jeff Casello to share a few words. Jigger, thanks so much for the introduction and thanks to everyone for attending this morning. I have a few slides that I would like to share with you um, this morning. So let me just uh, find that and we'll start it up. So um, can you just let me know, Jigger, are you seeing the slides? I am seeing your slides, yeah. Great, okay. Well, again, welcome everybody and thanks so much for making the time to join us this morning. It's um, it's really my pleasure to be able to come and talk with you a little bit about, um, well, I wanna do two things really in my opening remarks this morning. I want to spend a couple of minutes to start and we'll just leave this slide up as we do that to talk about the COVID situation at the university and what you can expect. And then from there, I will walk you through some slides that really I hope will present to you what we perceive um, graduate studies to be at the university and to really situate our focus on you as learners here at the university. So let me start by just saying um, that we had, of course, intended to be back on campus for this winter 2022 term. All of us um, administrators and instructors and students were eager, I think, to return to campus and be moving back towards normalcy. Of course, Omicron had other plans. And when we begin to say, um, well, in the weeks leading up to, um, to Omicron's outbreak, the province of Ontario was having two and 300 cases per day. Um, the most recent data are that the province is having 16,000 cases per day. So we've had you know, an 80 times increase in the number of, of cases that are occurring in the region of Waterloo, or sorry, in the province of Ontario. And that really forced our hand to move the initial part of the term into a, a fully remote delivery. So that's where we are, as you know, we're starting the term fully remotely. We have set a date of January 27th, where we hope that the university will be able to restart on-campus activities. There are a few on-campus activities that are ongoing now, um, very few in terms of some coursework and some other research activities. But really, we still are looking forward, and you may be asking what's happening in the time between now and January 27th. Um, so there's a number of things. The university, I think, is already well prepared. We've done quite a lot to work on safety protocols, to make sure our air filtration, to make our ventilation systems better at the university. We have protocols in place for course delivery, for research activities. Um, the real question is whether or not case rates are going to be sufficiently low to allow us to come together to interact in these very safe ways and not risk being in a place where we have you know, high breakout cases amongst our students, amongst our staff, amongst our faculty. So we'll continue to monitor the public health information. Um, our hope again is that um, after January 27th, we will be returning to in-person activities. Um, but the most that I can tell you now is that we continue to monitor public health data and see where we are. So um, I can tell you that there are daily meetings amongst the university senior leadership, the president, the provost and others come together on a daily basis to review these data and to see what is the right pathway for the university. So I think we're all a little bit disappointed that we're not together on campus physically, where they're having this session in a, a meeting room someplace on, on campus, but our hope is to remain positive, to remain optimistic and remain upbeat because the university, I think, is very well prepared to return to campus when the opportunity arises. And I'm sure there'll be some questions um, and certainly feel free to put those in the Q&A and, and Jigga will, will work with us and we'll get to the end of our 
uh, presentation today and we'll be able to answer some more of your questions there. But let me start with what I hope is a bit more inspirational message for you as you join us here at the University of Waterloo. I want to give you a statistical snapshot of what the university graduate community looks like. You're joining a community of about 6,200 graduate students, about which 4,000 are master's students. And when we talk about master's students, we talk about those that are enrolled in master in research programs. And for us, that means that you're in a program that has either a thesis requirement or a major research paper. So about half of our master students are in those research programs and another half of our masters are in those course based programs. We have about 2200 or 20 almost 2300 PhD students who are with us and amongst all of our graduate students um, about 35% of them are international and just under half of our graduate students are female graduate students. And we also have about 420 postdoctoral researchers at the University of Waterloo, and that's part of what my office looks after. And if you wanted to see how the um, numbers break down, here it is on a basis uh, by faculty. So we have, um, these are the number of PhDs in each of our faculties with engineering leading the way in terms of the number of PhDs, but math and arts uh, close behind. And of course, the course based masters, there's a really large concentration of those in engineering and in health, um, as well as in mathematics. So this is the breakdown of the university and the community that you're joining. And I hope it gives you a sense that this is a, you know, a pretty big group of students that you're joining. And, and I hope that as along the way, while you're studying with us, you become an active member of this community. And that's something that I do want to talk a little bit about with you today. So what is our vision? What we hope you achieve at the University of Waterloo? We want the University of Waterloo to be the very best place that it can be for you to be a graduate student in Canada um, and amongst the top destinations in the world. What do we think is unique about the university? Well, I say this all the time, like what Waterloo is really able to do is to customize your academic pathways so that you are able to determine for yourselves how it is you're going to achieve your personal, your professional and your academic goals. I think that when you come to Waterloo, you have the ability really to choose academic programming and choose a pathway for yourself that will really allow you to do whatever it is you wish. This is probably one of the most exciting times in your life. Um, you're coming to graduate school, you're curious, you're eager to study, and we're excited to help you on whatever pathway you wish to choose. And we really do need for you to tell us what it is that you're trying to hope, trying to achieve because we can help. And that's really the philosophy that we take to our graduate studies and to our graduate programming. And our commitment to you is there on the screen. We really want to create a cohesive framework of excellence. What does that mean? Well, we want to make sure that your academics are top notch. We believe that's the case and we continue to emphasize that throughout the university. We also want to make sure that our professional development is top notch. So if you've come to us and you're trying to advance your career, that's a pathway that we can help you with. The other thing that we also want to make sure is that if you have personal goals, if you want to become a more global citizen, you want to become more culturally aware, you want to become more um, educated about diversity and inclusion. We are, as a university, taking great strides to try and make those opportunities available to you. That's super important to us. Your experience while you're here at Waterloo is as important to us as your academics. And we take that quite seriously. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along today. I very much like this diagram because it shows what I think is the importance of the student life cycle. So, you know, we start out by wanting to attract and bring incredible students to Waterloo. And the fact that you have all have chosen us amongst all of the places where you as really bright and mobile folks could have chosen, that suggests to me that we're already successful in, in attracting exceptional scholars. So I think the first part is great out there because your presence here suggests that we're being successful in that area. So then the next question is, how do we make your academics as impactful as it possibly can be? And again, for your, um, for your own goals, your personal goals, your academic goals, and your professional goals. And one of the things that I think that Waterloo is really well known for is its experiential opportunities. Co-op is our brand and our identity at the undergraduate level. And as you'll see, I think when you are a graduate student, we are increasingly making opportunities example, uh, available to you to take your work that's happening in an academic setting and applying it beyond the university borders. And that's incredibly important. Again, I think one of the unique aspects of Waterloo is that we are able to translate what we do here at Waterloo to practice in ways that no other university in Canada can do. I think it's an exceptional attribute and that's where our experiential learning comes in. 
We're doing amazing research here at the University of Waterloo, um, both fundamental and, and by fundamental research, I mean you are really advancing the state of knowledge in your discipline. But maybe we're better known for our applied research and the kinds of applied research that we do are again the kinds of things that transform the way that practice happens. So if you're working in an AI lab thinking about how we can monitor water quality with Professor Alex Wong, that is a direct pathway to changing what's actually happening out in the world in terms of monitoring our water quality. If you're working in the area of health and health and technology, you may be designing systems that will actually monitor health outcomes automatically. You may be working on COVID solutions. You may be working on helmets that help our military in ways that allow them to be um, healthier and not suffer the damage while still wearing protective equipment. These are the kinds of things that are happening every day at the University of Waterloo, and we couldn't be more excited about the research that is ongoing here. Again, your experience, what we want more than anything else is for you to, at the end of your time at the University of Waterloo, to look back and say that Waterloo has not only provided you an exceptional education, but has given you an opportunity to grow as a person We've made your experience here wonderful. We really want you to leave Waterloo thinking that only at Waterloo could you have had not only, again, the exceptional academic experience, but the personal growth and the professional development that Waterloo makes possible. And we want to help you when you leave us. Um, we want to make sure that you are now moving on to whatever is next for you, whether that is a position as a faculty member, whether that is a position as a researcher, whether that is a person who's returning to industry, whether that means that you want to become a parent. We want to make sure that all of those things are possible for you. And the university wants to remain available to you to support you as you move forward in what comes next for you. It's super important to us. We think that you come back to us because you have an innate curiosity. That's what I've said already, that you want to deepen your learning, that you want to advance your careers. But most importantly, I think we think you come back to us because you want to become impactful. And so how do we make sure that we allow you that pathway to be impactful? Well, five of our six faculties offer course based programs. Um, all six of our faculties obviously have research programs. There's about 134 of them. You're joining a community that has almost 70 PhD programs. We have 12 graduate diplomas. If you don't know what those are, those are um, those are academic credentials that you can get that are complementary to your core discipline. So you can get a graduate diploma, for example, in understanding the application of statistics and, and artificial intelligence for social sciences in the humanities. That's a diploma that's offered out of the Faculty of Arts. So if you're interested in broadening your kinds of academic pursuits, take a look at our graduate diplomas. And one thing that Waterloo is really proud of and that we're growing is the number of interdisciplinary cutting edge pro graduate programs, maybe the most famous of which is our water program that brings students from across the campus from different disciplinary backgrounds, whether it's civil engineering or biology or economics or, um, or health, you can come together with other students who are studying water and you can take your disciplinary backgrounds and apply it to this thematic outcome. It's a really great way for us to create communities of scholars across the disciplines with a focus on, on, on themes and on, on um, important problems for society and communities. How do we know that you're being impactful? Well, we have real evidence about what the research dissemination is for our graduate students. We look at the number of student authored or co-authored research papers, um, articles, conference, and not just limited to, to technical journals, but also exhibits. Our fine arts program has an incredible number of outputs and disseminations that are for us at Waterloo equally important or more important than the things that are happening on the STEM side of the house. We know that you'll be involved in workshops in the community. We know that you might give testimony to governments. This is the kind of opportunities that we try to facilitate and catalyze through our research um, mission at the university. We know that you have come to us because you are creative and you may want to be involved in intellectual property crea creation. You may want to commercialize some of your ideas. And of course, Waterloo Spirit is, is embedded with entrepreneurial activities throughout the university campus. And again, not just in our STEM disciplines, but across all six of our faculties. And I think that these data that we're generating and that we're observing here really demonstrate the importance that all of you have as graduate students on leading our research agenda at the university. Let's get to the graduate student experience issue. 
we believe, and this is the culture that my office, the Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs, is trying to create throughout the university campus. Every interaction that you have with the university is an opportunity for us to empower you, to demonstrate our empathy towards you, to promote the ideas of equity, and to support you as a graduate student as you move forward. And we recognize that that's a distributed responsibility. Everybody on the campus should take that responsibility seriously. And so what we've been promoting is that these are the people that are the most important probably for you and that you are likely to interact with the most, most frequently. If you're in a research program, your supervisor is obviously going to be incredibly important. They're the person who will be the first point of contact for you for all questions that you might have, academic or otherwise. So really, I encourage you to become colleagues and become friends and become mentors with your with your research supervisor it's an important relationship and to whatever you can do to develop that relationship it's incredibly incredibly important if you're in a course-based program we have a faculty member who's dedicated to overseeing that program that person's known as your program director so your program director for course-based students really plays the role as a de facto supervisor for you. So all the things I just said about your supervisory relationship, that also holds true for your program directors. Within each department at the university, there's someone who's called the graduate officer. Sometimes they're an, a, an associate chair, sometimes they're an associate director, but that's a faculty member whose job it is to look after the graduate students in the department. And you should get to know who your graduate officer is in your, um, in your department. It's an important person for you to know and someone who you'll wanna reach out to. The other person that's really important is your graduate coordinator. This is the staff person who supports the graduate officer, but supports you as graduate students in your department. So get to know who your graduate officer is and who your graduate coordinator is. These are really important people for you in terms of managing and allowing you to customize your academics and your experience at the university. At the faculty level, all six faculties have an associate dean for graduate studies. So this is the person who really leads the faculty in terms of providing direction and works with all of the graduate officers and the graduate coordinators to lead the graduate studies portfolio in each of the faculties. And then of course, at the university level, there's administrators like me in the graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs and all of my colleagues, um, 35 strong in GSPA who wanna help you achieve your goals at the university. So how do we create your experience? Well, we are the things that we look after directly in GSPA are your student funding. And that means if you're a research student, we help get your student um, support coded to your account, making sure you're getting paid. We do some graduate student programming. We have also, we look after all of the um, graduate administration. So if there's a calendar change, if there's some kind of regulation change that happens for us through GSPA. We're also looking after the student supervisor relationship, but maybe most importantly, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a community of people who again, are here exclusively to support you as you try to achieve your, your missions. We don't work alone. We partner with lots of other folks, including we do something called ads workshop. So if you are a graduate student supervisor, you have to have ad status and we make sure that you are well equipped to be a graduate student supervisor. Brad Flicks, you would have seen the image on the previous slide. Here it is. This is the program that we created that allows, uh, that encourages graduate students to make a one minute video of their thesis work and, and do it in a way that is fun and allows you to um, create this video, show it off at a movie premiere that we run and also allows you, of course, to load these things up to LinkedIn so that they can be a way for you to build a marketing and an identity for yourself um, professionally outside of the university. When you become a PhD candidate, when you pass your comprehensive exams, we, we've um, created an event to celebrate that accomplishment for you, along with the Writing and Communication Center and the Center for Teaching Excellence. The picture on the right shows a recent development that we've created here at the university. We have a celebration exclusively for our PhDs um, when they graduate, and this is from fall 2020. The person in the middle is our Governor General Gold Medal Award winner. Um, he's holding the university mace, and this is a really exceptional celebration of our graduate students. We also do a lot on Professional Skills Foundation, and I'll talk to you um, a little bit more about that. One of the things that's been really important during the pandemic and more generally is to support you in terms of your access to counseling services. And so we've been working closely with our counseling services and with student wellness more generally to make sure that they have supports in place to support our graduate community because we understand that you have unique needs and you have, have 
you know, perhaps different kinds of requirements and different kinds of um, needs from your health and well-being than our undergraduate community. So we've been working closely with them on trying to upgrade the um, and, and develop new programming for you um, with our counseling services and again with, with wellness. So what is the Professional Skills Foundation? So this is something that's run out of my office. Um, the intention here is really to make sure that you are leaving Waterloo, not again, again, not only with your academics, but with the um, capacity to be successful as you move out into the workforce. So this is really about being able to articulate what skills you think you have it's, it helps you be ready for interviewing. It helps you to be ready for to be successful in networking set, settings and so on. So if you are eager to advance your professional skills and be ready to be um, contributing to the workforce, this is a program that I really strongly encourage you to, to, look at, to look out for and get involved with. We also run conferences. If you are looking for an academic career or a non-academic career, GSPA is pleased to, um, to support you as you try to pursue those, um, those outcomes for yourself. This is my last slide, and I know that was quick, but we're a little bit up against time. Um, so I want to leave you with this message. The university really is eager to support you in all that you hope to achieve, but we can only do that if you keep in touch with us. And so what does keeping in touch with us mean? Well, all the folks that I talked about, your supervisor, your program director, your grad coordinator, your grad officer, Talk to those folks, let them know the things that are working well and the things that aren't working well. And that's where the second bullet comes in. If you're struggling in any way, if you're struggling with your health, with your financial well-being, academically, if you're struggling personally, if your mom or dad, God forbid, fall ill, the university is really well prepared to support those kinds of, those kinds of outcomes. We can help. So just let us know and we can do it in a way that's going to be very respectful of your privacy and of your own agency. And maybe my last and hopefully inspirational message to you is that our university only works because we have exceptional students. You come to us, you challenge us. We wanna challenge you academically, but we expect that you'll challenge us as well. You really are the future. You're the ones who are going to think differently. You're the one that's going to drive innovation. You're the one that's going to drive change. We're here to help, but we require that. We need you to challenge us. And I mean that sincerely. So think outside the box, push the envelope, work with us and collectively we'll do things that are going to be amazing. I couldn't be more pleased to be leading our graduate community here to welcome you to Waterloo. And I really look forward to supporting you throughout your academic career. So Jigger, over to you if there are questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, a question I had, if you don't mind, is uh, sp specifically towards research students, although it could apply to coursework students as well, but. If, if an incoming student is starting with in-person restrictions already in place, and this is something I experienced because I started when there were restrictions. So, you know, research is, is such an abstract and unstructured activity that it often needs a lot of momentum and brainstorming and, you know, to create that buzz, which kind of gets you going. And I I experienced that it can be hard when you're you're just, you know, by yourself at home and trying to think all these large ideas. Uh, and some students that are starting their PhDs and masters are to the point where they haven't even met their advisors in person yet, and I'm one of them. So what advice would you give to an incoming graduate student who's, you know, has all these thoughts about building research momentum? And it could be coursework momentum as well. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that we really need to take advantage of technology. Um, one of the things that I do regularly with my grad students is I get everybody together each week and we meet over Zoom or we meet over Teams and we chat through these things. Um, I think that in this era of remote working, it's super important to be purposeful about your communications with your supervisor. You know, normally if you are working in the same building, if you don't have a scheduled meeting, you can always walk down the hall and pop in and say, hey, do you have a few minutes? Um, that can't happen as easily um, in a remote world. So it's super important that you and your supervisor, you know, schedule that next meeting, block out the time, be prepared for that. The other thing that I think is super important is because all of the students are operating remotely, it's it makes a lot of sense for the students to get together. I mean, just come together as a group of students and chat, you know, whether it's a Friday afternoon and you're enjoying a warm or cold beverage of your choice um, and you want to just chat through what's been on your mind for the week. 
Um, maybe something that you've read has gotten you excited. Maybe something that's happened in the world has gotten you excited about your research. Come together with your peers. I mean, this is really where community starts. And in some ways, technology has made that community building a little bit easier, to be honest, um, because it's very easy to get people together on a call like this um, where you can chat. So I, I feel the frustration of not being physically present, of not being able to look and shake hands with your supervisor and, and have a one-on-one -on -one chat. But I guess the, the, the bit of advice I would have is to be purposeful and be direct and, and make sure you're taking active steps to continue that engagement. And your supervisor should be doing the same thing. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's, that's, a, that's an excellent insight because the common misconception is that research is a solitary endeavor. And it, I think we think that, but like Jeff said, we kind of take it for granted, those little moments where we can just pop in and chat a little bit with our advisor, but then we go back to our desk and think that research is solitary. It's really not. And I think that the pandemic is starting to make us realize that there are these levels of solitary and this is a whole new level. So I think it's a, it's a really great advice that you use. You need to start replacing those small moments of interactions that happened organically with unfortunate but intentional scheduled interactions. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so uh, I think uh, if if questions happen, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, there's there's really no pressure to think of questions right away. Uh, we can definitely get in touch with Jeff at a later time and make sure that any post thoughts that you have after the live sessions um, will also get addressed. So take your time. If there's questions, think it through and put them on the discussion board, and we'll get you the answers. Let me just say before I step away, I do have a 10 o'clock commitment, um, but I just wanted to again thank the attendees and thank all of you for the organization and, and really just let folks know that if there's anything that we can help with in graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs, um, you can find me on the web. If you email me, I'm, I'm very good about responding. I'll, I'll do my very best to get back to you as quickly as I can. Really, if there's anything on your mind at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do everybody on the line a favor and I'll, I'll copy and paste Jeff's email link just for access. Uh, and yeah, like Jeff said, please feel to reach out either via us or directly to him since he said he's pretty open. So whatever channel you prefer. Thank you again, Jeff. We really appreciate all Great. the good Cheers. information that you gave. Take care now. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Tyler Hampton. Tyler, you want to share your screen? Can you let me know that that's coming through? Yep, I can see your screen. Thank you. OK, excellent. So hello, everyone. See some here this morning on a lovely Thursday. Um, I'm Tyler Hampton. I'm the Vice President of Communications with the Graduate Student Association. Um, I'm going to try to riff off of a lot of Jeff's themes about community here. So I, I think it's most important for graduate students to know that in addition to the Graduate Studies Postdoctoral Affairs Office, um, the students that are in this call from the Student Success Office providing services for students, the Graduate Student Association is also here to follow you along in your studies, to be a community for you and to provide services for you. Today I'm going to be providing an overview of what these services are. Uh, many of them you may have already been accessing or been familiar with, and some that I hope you will take advantage of in the next term, whether the next term stays online or goes back to in person, um, they will be here for you. So just a bit about me, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, I'm both the Vice President of Communications for the GSA and also the Speaker of the Council, and I'll talk about the Council and the role that grad community and representation plays. So the Graduate Student Association envisions a university where the interests of graduate students are protected, their voices are heard, and where graduate students are able to realize themselves free from social, financial, academic, environmental, and physiological barriers. We're serving the graduate students of the University of Waterloo with dedication and commitment to enhance the quality of their academic and social experience and promote their well-being. So an overview of our organization, we're quite large, as, as Jeff talked about, Membership of graduate student community is over 5,500, maybe closer to 6,000. Um, 
the Graduate Student Association has a three branched system. We have a president of the Graduate Student Association. Um, we also have a board of directors as we're a not for profit corporation and we have a council. So I'll just note the council has about 50 members representing all of the, of the departments and academic programs at the university. The board of directors has 12 members and importantly, both of these bodies are elected by the membership, you. So you can find out more about our full um, staff and our organizational chart on our website. I've included links to these slides and they'll be available as well on the LEARN website. So I just want to share our GSA team is larger than ever. We have a full staff of coordinators on the left um, and an executive team, including the president, uh, Zabine Kamisa in orange on the right. There's also an opportunity to come meet us. So we'll be having an online event um, on January 11th at 10.30 a.m. You can come chat with us, ask us any questions if you don't have them answered here uh, in this live session. Ask us questions, just get to know us, get to know opportunities to join our community and possibly work with the GSA. As you've seen, there's a lot of different positions that can be filled by graduate students. In addition, tomorrow, uh, Friday, January 7th, our GSA newsletter will be going out to you. So if you're a new student this term, this will be the first GSA e-news that you'll receive in your inbox. So be sure to look for that email. There is a lot of information about GSA services, which I'm going to cover today. Um, but there's also a lot of events happening in January that are online, accommodating this online so I'm going to spend most of the presentation talking about services because it's really important that students know how to access these, how to, what their student fees that they see on their quest bill will go towards. Um, when they're in a crisis or just need help with something, where can you turn to? And the GSA is often one of those places. So we offer political representation, the Grand River Transit and ION Transit Pass, legal and tax aid, academic supports, student advocacy and advising funding for events, uh, the health and dental plans, including mental health supports, and we also uh, produce events and run the Graduate House, which is on campus. So the Grand River, Tra uh, River Transit and ION Pass provides unlimited access to Grand River Transit and ION services throughout Waterloo Region. If you were not a student and you were buying an annual pass, um, compared to if you are a student, you get about a 70% discount through the joint purchasing of this plan that all graduate students participate in. Your WAT card, which you'll receive through the Student Life Center, is your UPASS. So you tap that card on the bus. There is a Grand River Transit uh, refund program. So if you are not in Waterloo Region, there are options to have this fee refunded about once per year. So check your email tomorrow again for our GSA e newsletter, but we'll also mention how to have this pass refunded if you're not in Waterloo Region. The GSA has a health plan for graduate students that is through the company Student Care. The health plan includes access to health professionals, coverage of prescription drugs, vaccination, diagnostic services, and medical equipment. Includes health coverage up to $10,000, vision coverage, and travel coverage. The dental plan is supplementary de dental coverage for graduate students. We also partner with Student Care on this plan. It covers up to 60 to 70% of your dental costs. And an additional 20 to 30 percent can be covered if you're visiting professionals within the student care network. International students are also automatically covered and billed for this plan. Mental health is one of the services that has most grown over the last several years and of course during the pandemic. Um, there's two key services that we want to highlight. One is a GSA and student care service called Empower Me. Uh, you can see a phone line here on this slide. Uh, that is access to get counseling services through the Empower Me service. It's all over phone or on video call, so it's unfortunately perfect for the, the online world we're living in right now. There's also a service available in Ontario called Good to Talk, and this is again free confidential support for students in Ontario, and the phone number here, uh, as well as other ways to contact them, is on this slide. Legal Aid is a really important service that we offer. Um, we just added this service in 2020 and it's had great uptake. This uh, aid comes with a legal assistance helpline that's toll free and that's on this slide. You can consult a lawyer directly with any legal question. Um, principally, there's areas of housing disputes, employment disputes and disputes with academic institutions that can be covered here in addition to possibly covering the fees of any proceedings related to that. Advise 
is one of our oldest services. In addition to our health plans, we offer confidential advising appointments. So if you have an issue of any kind that, it, that can include behavior towards you that you've experienced or seen, any academic um, experiences like unfair grades or deadlines that have passed and you need help with or intellectual property questions, you can come to us and book an appointment. So the GSA services website is in the bottom left of the slide. On the GSA website, you can also fill out the contact us form and indicate the kind of problem you're having and you'll be directed to set up an appointment with our wellness coordinator who can guide you through uh, any of the issues you're having. Labor education is being piloted this month. So in January 2022, we've just launched a new portion of our website that's providing resources for students about their work experiences. So this includes your experiences as a graduate teaching assistant, a graduate research assistant, or a sessional instructor. So we think it's really important for students to have up-to-date knowledge and tools to navigate these work experiences and to know your rights in these experiences. So the website here is listed. In addition, there are now office hours that are going to be held um, for you to ask labor specific questions to our GSA labor coordinator. Um, check out our newsletter again tomorrow, Friday, January 7th, and the office hours will be shared in that newsletter. And finally, the Graduate House. Um, the Graduate House is uh, one of our most recognizable uh, features on the campus. It doesn't match all the fancy buildings of uh, the Quantum Nano Center or the engineering buildings. The Graduate House is the original farmhouse uh, that was on the land before the University of Waterloo existed. The Graduate House is a restaurant, so a lot of the times we have students come to campus, they see a sign saying Graduate House and they say, is this a dorm? Is it a clubhouse? What is it? Uh, the Graduate House is a restaurant and bar and social space operated by the Graduate Student Association. Um, the Graduate House is subsidized by fees that you pay for as graduate students. That gets you deals, extreme discounts on the great food we have, and right now we're offering free coffee. So you should know for January 22, 2022, we're open for carryout food. Um, we have locally sourced ingredients, halal chicken, campus-grown vegetables, especially in the spring and summer, and all of these are part of GSA's commitment to sustainability. So we hope, especially as the restrictions on restaurants evolve, that the Graduate House can be a place for community. I think talking not about just immediate services, what Jeff talked about with finding community, the Graduate House is a place that professors come to, that students, undergraduates and graduates alike, and staff come to, to sit, have a meal, have a drink, and hold socials with their various clubs. So we have multiple multifunction rooms that allow for students to use this as a space. And so hopefully, um, even if uh, restrictions on restaurants are lifted, this can be a community space for you. And I anticipate if you're going to be here for a few years, this will certainly be one of those. So shifting away from GSA services, I'll highlight the political positions that the GSA has held on behalf of graduate students. So before I'll, I mentioned the GSA governance structure, including the board of directors and the council. And again, the council had representation from all departments and programs on this campus. So the council determines political positions for the Graduate Student Association. And these four political positions are ensuring ethical academic employment and social policies for students, mitigating barriers to pursuing graduate education in Ontario, encouraging the University of Waterloo and the region of Waterloo at large to be leaders in sustainability and supporting student mental wellness. So I hope you can see how the services that we offer are reflected in these political positions that we hold. There are some other initiatives that are tied to both our political positions and the services. Um, some new ones are the, gra the Graduate Student um, BIPOC Collective. This is a solidarity and community space for BIPOC LGBTQ2 plus students. I have a link here for a Discord that students can access. Um, of course, this is an online space, but especially in the last two years, of COVID, this is still a great place for to connect. There are social events um, that are in the audio channels of Discord. If you've used Discord before, um, there's social, social, excuse me, there's social times uh, to participate and meet students, especially if you're new here. There is also a Discord channel for international students at the University of Waterloo. And here, there again, there are social events on the Discord. You can share stories, just share problems you're having. Um, I think. As Jeff mentioned, there are many offices to help you as international students, um, including the immigration services. Going to your peers is an option that's certainly available and asking if someone has had a similar experience. So this Discord link is also here. So I encourage you to join. And finally, another initiative 
from the GSA's the Philanthropy Fund, where we partner with organizations in the region of Waterloo that offer ser services to the whole community. And of course, that community includes students. So we give out four $1,000 grants uh, to partnership organizations that advocate for the GSA political positions. Some notable endorsements that the Graduate Student Association has taken with votes from the council. In early fall term 2021, uh, the Faculty Association at the University of Waterloo had an open letter asking for a vaccine mandate for on-campus activity. Uh, the Graduate Student Association endorsed this open letter, and of course the vaccine mandate came to pass on the University of Waterloo campus. The GSA has also supported a student-led unionization effort called Organize UW for graduate students, workers, including TAs, RAs, and sessionals. And you can find the Organize UW website here for more information. So I've laid out a pretty large and expansive organization. We can't do the work that we do without graduate student participation. Um, there are lots of ways to get involved. There's the GSA Council, which I've mentioned a few times, representing all departments and programs. There's a board of directors for those who have or want to have a bit more not-for-profit experience. There are executive positions, coordinator positions, research contracts for short-term research issues and employment at the Graduate House Restaurant. So on the website here, get involved. All of our positions are posted here. I've mentioned the council a little bit. So right now there are opportunities to apply for council positions. Our governance and council website is below. You can fill out a council representation nomination form that's on the GSA website. And there's a list currently of open positions for council and departments that currently don't have a counselor. And finally, our partnerships are often with departmental GSAs or DGSAs and other campus-wide GSAs. So this list on the slide is really large. There are a ton of different communities that graduate students have also formed for themselves that are either within their faculties or departments or across departments. And so notably, um, the Artificial Intelligence Institute or the um, Students of the Water Institute graduate section take place and accept students from all departments. This list really here is a place for graduate students to connect with each other um, engage with both the broader GSA and your peers within your department. Finally, it's really important to stay connected with the GSA. I said one more time that the newsletter will be coming out tomorrow on the 7th. You can, in the meantime, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I would be happy to take any questions about the GSA. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh... As somebody who's benefited from some of the, the things that Tyler covered in his presentation, uh, the heavily discounted GRT pass, uh, the student care program, uh, I definitely agree with everything he covered. It is, it is extremely valuable for uh, graduate students. So if, if you are on campus and you're studying in person in Waterloo, I mean not in person, but if you're in Waterloo, definitely do try to take advantage of um, all the heavy discounts on the different services that Tyler mentioned. Uh, the, the cost does reduce quite a bit and in and, and return the value does not. So uh, thanks again, Tyler. There's, there's a couple of questions that I'll read out. The first one is, I am enrolled in a course-based master's program. How do I get involved in research and entrepreneurial activities along with my course? Yeah, Jigger, do you want me to take a crack at that question? Sure, sure thing, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I think the, the hard part I see is, so I'm in a PhD program, uh, but of course I've done a master's program and two years can feel like simultaneously a long and a short amount of time. Um, hopefully if someone's starting a master's now, the likelihood of having in-person experiences, whether that's meeting with your peers over coffee or, one moment, I apologize. So experiences of getting meeting peers over coffee, uh, experiences of just taking courses in line and talking with professors um, is more likely in the future than it has been in the past two years. Um, I think in terms of research and entrepreneurial activities, um, graduate student communities have been set up. So the, the DGSA page that I mentioned, um, I think is the most likely place to find students that are in a similar course-based master's program students that are also looking for entrepreneurial activities or intellectual property uh, development. I think that is your best bet to find students that have similar interests and to build community with them. And I know a lot of those departmental 
GSAs have built up online community uh, where in-person in community used to be their dominant form of communication. Thank you, Tyler. I, I completely agree. And uh, like Tyler said, a course based masters is, is a tricky is a tricky monster because it can seem like a really small time, but at the same time, it can feel like a long time as well. So I think when I was doing my master's degree, I, I had no plans to do a PhD and I, I could relate to this instinct where I wanted to get involved, but I also knew that I have a lot to finish. So I would kind of repackage what Tyler said in just my own words by saying uh, before you you decide to get involved and there's there's a ton of options uh, as you just saw in the slides before try to think of the scope in which you want to get involved just because you already have a lot of things going on and you don't want to overcommit. Uh, so think through on on the few things that you want to get involved in and try not to spread yourself too thin especially because we're we're doing our degrees and in, in this hybrid challenging environment right now and you should not underestimate the time and effort it takes to just get through the program with all the restrictions in place so uh, but in terms of how how to get involved I think Tyler covered it pretty well another question that is specifically for you Tyler is uh, could you share a little bit more on your personal experience as a graduate student in the university specifically in the water program? Yeah, so I think I'll talk about the water program first. Um, this connects to what you were talking about is like finding finding community and, and committing yourself. Um, obviously, I'm working with the GSA as um, all the other panelists are working with the um, graduate student uh, students and student success office. Um, Getting involved and committing yourself to helping other graduate students is also, it has benefits to you. And so in the water program specifically, I, I found that um, it's one of those strange programs. And I think students that are in like the artificial intelligence program find themselves in this position that you might not feel as home in your own department. So for myself in earth sciences, I didn't feel that I related very much to students in the earth science program who do more geology. I was doing more water quality work. And so thankfully there are student communities uh, like the students of the Water Institute graduate section that provide a home for misfit students that that don't that are doing water research across all different fields, whether it's economics um, to public health or to physical sciences. Um, they provided the home for that and I think that scenario maps out across many students so if you if you don't feel like you fit the exact niche of a department whether it's a small department or a large department I think there are student communities for you to find in terms of my experience as a graduate student of course the majority of my PhD uh, maybe only half at this point has been before the pandemic and I think some of my experience during the last two years during the pandemic explains a bit what what Jigger you're talking about about um, stretching yourself thin and feeling like trying to do the the before times um, level of involvement was not super practical anymore and so I, I feel like if you're just starting a program now maybe you don't have that expectation of what it means to be involved in all of these various things maybe you feel like your degree could take more priority I think you have to balance that with what community brings to you so that's your friends, that's your colleagues, the folks that you will work with and connect with as alumni of this university. Um, I think that there are ways to find that balance and to say I want to have community and peers um, find a space that is giving me like enjoyment and motivation to keep doing this program and motivation to pursue this career path that I've mapped out for myself and that others in your peer group may also be envisioning. That's an excellent point. Uh, Tyler, because while I said that you, you don't want to spread yourself too thin on the flip side, I think it is also true that in 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 a time like today, community is is one of the more underrated ways of taking a break from the, the stress of your graduate studies and and research problems that you're trying to solve because uh, I don't think we realized before the pandemic forced us to think about it, but we, we actually do need a lot of peer to peer connection and just time in the social environment uh, and not just, you know, speaking over video calls or just actual in person interaction. 
uh, video calls are a good sub substitute, but uh, so you can think of community uh, engagement as a really healthy way of taking a break from your graduate studies. That's that's an excellent point, uh, which which is a which is a good segue into the next question I have is. Uh, what social events are happening in January for graduate students that you know of and what are the plans for events for the rest of the term? Well, I can quickly access that list if we have time to humor, if you have time to humor me. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I already mentioned that there is a meet and greet event on January 11th at 1030 in the morning um, for the GSA. Certainly this is a social event. Um, the GSA folks all know each other and so we're here to introduce ourselves to you if you want to come and meet us. So um, the link for that event is going to be in the newsletter that's sent out tomorrow. It was also in the slides that will be up to, uploaded to learn. There is a speed friending event on January 13th. I know it sounds a little cliche, but of course we're online and meeting peers is often what students ask for. It sounds cliche, but students want to meet their peers. Um, and so these events have been uh, highly attended in the past. So we have a Zoom link uh, coming out tomorrow in the newsletter for that. The 13th. Um, there is an event on work assignments. So again, if you're a TA or RA this term, um, especially before the term really gets into full swing, we have an event on January 25th. Um, for you to just talk with peers about questions you have about your work as a TA, how it might change over the course of a term, what kind of hours you're supposed to be working, how what students can share about their experiences logging those hours. That's going to be January 5th at 2 o'clock. Um, the BIPOC Collective has a solidarity chat coming up on January 26th at 7 o'clock at night, and that'll be taking place in the Discord. Um, I shared the Discord link in the slides that I shared today. There's also a Candid Talks series that we run. So this is an open room like this for students to discuss a certain topic. This topic will be navigating interpersonal conflict. Um, that event will be at 1 p.m. on January 27th. And then fingers crossed that we on January 31st, we have a community stroll. Um, so we'll be meeting at the Graduate House on campus. This will be an in-person event, hopefully uh, outdoor in-person events can have a somewhat larger capacity, but right now we do have a registration link that will be collecting responses um, again in the newsletter tomorrow, and that's January 31st at 11 a.m. and it'll be walking around campus. I think hot, co hot cocoa will be offered. That sounds great. And they, they asked about um, what the rest of the term looks like. Um, there's, there's two facets to the graduate student association's way of trying to build community. But there's three. There's all the online events we just talked about, including several Discord channels, so the BIPOC Collective and the International Student um, Discord channel. There are in-person events like the Community Stroll that can happen um, depending on certain restrictions. So in case this is following the province's outdoor gathering restriction. Um, the third category is events that are at the Graduate House itself inside. The Graduate House is a restaurant, so it follows Ontario's restaurant restrictions. Right now, the graduate house is open for carry out, as I said, um, but we anticipate that the province will be changing its regulations on restaurants sometime in the next month. Um, and once that happens, if restaurants are allowed to be open with certain capacity limits, um, the restaurant is a place for students to gather, share meals, but also just have social gatherings where we're not going to force you to eat the delicious food, but you can still gather there. And I can testify to that being a, a really um, de-stressing experience. I started my PhD in the spring last year and it was completely virtual. No no in-person events had happened. So when the first social happened at the grad house in fall, uh, I met so many graduate students who had gone through similar uh, concerns and anxieties as I had. And it was just nice to kind of strike a chord with them and just know that I wasn't alone. So uh, definitely consider um, visiting the grad house whenever you can, either for takeout or whenever there's an actual in-person social. I can testify to that being super useful for any graduate student. And one uh -huh. thing about you mentioned starting in the spring term, um, once the warm weather comes, which I assure you the warm weather will come again, um, we just have to get through February and March and January. Um, the patio that the graduate house uh, had constructed during COVID will be open. So there's a lot more space for students to gather at the graduate house. And we also use the lawn next to the graduate house for many socials once the weather's warm again. 
Yep. Thank you. And uh, there's there's been requests for the slides. Uh, please know that we will be uploading the slides. Uh, check my post in the Q&A. The slides will go to Learn uh, Grad Ready Venture 2022 Live Session Recordings tab. Uh, in it, we will upload both the video of today's session and the slides themselves. If Tyler has the link handy, uh, uh, Tyler, if you can send me the link in the chat, I can actually post it in the Q&A right now so that they don't have to wait till they can join the Discord channel at least. I feel like uh, the International Students Discord would be pretty useful for anybody who's on the line. So if you can send me that on the chat, I can post it in the Q&A. And don't worry, we will be still sharing the slides, so you will have access to all the links in the slides. It'll just be a while before we get around to uploading everything, so uh, just please be patient. We'll get there. Uh, one question I had was for a, by a PhD student in MME. How many courses should I clear during my PhD? Could you please throw some light on how PhD courses have been designed? I will answer based on what I think the question is about, and then I'll pass it over to Tyler to kind of give the finishing touches. Uh, I'm a PhD student in MME, so I know that I have to clear three graduate level courses minimum, uh, but don't take my word for it. Just double check with your advisor on which and how many courses they would like you to take and when. Uh, also, stay in touch with the, your program coordinator to make sure that there's there haven't been any changes. It's always a good idea. I don't think there have been changes, but it's always a good idea to hear from the official channels. But last I checked, it was three. And uh, the overview of the PhD courses that I understand is you have to take three courses and three courses if you don't already have, if you have a master's. If you don't have a master's, then that's a different story. But if you have a master's, it's three courses. Sometime before your fifth term, you have to give your comprehensive exam which is basically you trying to convince a committee of members that the research plan you have and the goal you want to achieve is solid and thought through. Uh, you can evidence that by either doing some research early on or just doing a comprehensive literature review. Um, there's different ways of doing that, but the comprehensive exam is you trying to convince that your research plan is solid and then you finish doing your research based on your plan and then you defend your PhD and, and you're done although it is far, far easier said than done. I'm, the, don't, the overview is a bit simplistic, but uh, any more details that Tyler, you want to add based on your experience? No, I, I think your experience in MME is, is certainly um, more applicable than me. Um, I feel like it really depends on, to, to, to me, the course's proximity to your research or your, I guess, even frankly, your interests. Um, can determine like how much you can fit it in. So if it's directly tied to your thesis research, it may feel like in the Venn diagram of how much time you're spending on your thesis versus your courses, maybe it falls in the middle and you feel like it's at least accomplishing some thesis work, um, as opposed to some courses that maybe are required by um, the department and you feel like are rounding you out in terms of your expertise, but are not directly applying to your thesis as the thing that you're gonna be working on for the few years. Yep. yep, that's that's a good way of putting it. Thank you, Tyler. All right, I think we are we are out of time. So uh, if anybody on the line should have any further questions, first and foremost, the discussion boards are a good place to start. The discussion boards have dedicated threads for each live session. That way we can stay organized and we know that this question was directed towards a specific presenter. So if you have questions for Tyler, just go ahead and post the question on the discussion board. Uh, I, I'm, I would let Tyler decide whether or not he's open to having questions directly sent to his email or something. Uh, if he is, then you can do that. Yeah, can I can I post my email in the, is it in sure. the yeah. announcement? Yeah. yeah. Did the Discord come through? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you. OK. Yeah, so my email, I'm open to having any questions. Awesome. So I think that is it. Uh, please don't hesitate in asking any follow up questions and try to access all the resources that we will post and learn, including this recording. And 
Stay safe. Take care. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you, Deepika.